Hi everyone, it's Professor Primington, and in this video we're going to talk about graphs of functions. So in the previous video we talked about what is actually a function mathematically and its definition. One of the most important parts about understanding a function is we can actually visualize it with a graph. So in this section we're going to investigate in more detail the concept of actually graphing functions by both plotting points and actually explore some of the concepts of a function that we encountered in the previous section. So in this section we're going to talk about how to graph a function by determining a set of ordered pairs. We're going to use a graphing calculator to graph a function using a specified viewing window. We're going to determine whether a graph actually represents a function using a vertical line test, and then also determine whether an equation represents a function. So let's start with graphing functions by plotting points. So if you actually want to graph a function f, we actually are going to plot points of the form x, f of x, or order pairs x, y, in the Cartesian or the xy coordinate system. So in other words, all these points x, y, the x coordinate is coming from the domain that we talked about in the previous video. It's an input value. And the y coordinate is the second coordinate in the ordered pair, and it's the output value that's a corresponding with the x value. So the definition for a graph of a function, the function f with a domain a is a graph of ordered pairs. It's of the form, the set of all ordered pairs, x, y, or x, f of x, where x is a value from the domain, or an input value. So it's all these points plotted that makes up the graph of a function. Sometimes you might actually see a function represented as an equation of the form y equals f of x. That just means that you're, if you're inputting all the possible x values from the domain, you're going to get the corresponding y values, and then you can plot all these points, x comma y, these ordered pairs, and that will give you a visualization of what the function looks like with the graph. So there's a couple of functions that we're going to talk about first. So a function of the form f of x equals mx plus b, we talked about in the previous video, is what's called a linear function. Because the graph is y equals mx plus b, it represents a line when you visualize it with a graph. The slope is the number m in front of the variable x, so it's the coefficient of x. And the y-intercept is the number b, it's the constant term. Now there is a special case of linear functions, is where your slope is zero, and it's what's called a constant function. So whenever you have 0 times x, that term will disappear, and you'll have f of x equals b or y equals b. Those are called constant functions. Their graphs are horizontal lines where the slope is 0 and the y-intercept is b. And so to see what the graphs look like, the graph on the left is a graph of a constant function, y equals 3 or f of x equals 3. The horizontal line crosses the y-axis at the y-intercept 0, 3, and it has a slope of 0. And so this is a constant function. The graph on the right is a linear function where you have a slope of 2 because the equation is y equals 2x plus 1. The graph will cross the y-axis at 1 because that's the y-intercept. So example 1. We're going to graph functions by plotting points first. Graph the following functions by plotting points in the rectangular coordinate system or xy plane. So number 1. f of x is equal to this function, negative x squared minus x plus 4. Notice that this function has a highest power is 2, so it's what's called a quadratic function. So to actually find out what the graph looks like, we're going to plot points. You can choose any x value that you want as long as the x values in the domain of that function. So I chose these x values, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, some negative x values, some positive x values, and 0 is always a good x value to plug into a function, if possible. So when you plug in negative 2 and you plug in for all the x values like we did in the previous video, then the y value will be 2. So that means when x is negative 2, the associated y value is 2, and that's going to determine an ordered pair, negative 2, comma 2. So whenever x is negative 2, the y value will be 2, and that's one point on the graph. Now do the same thing when x equals negative 1. You plug in negative 1 into your function, and the output will be 4. So negative 1, comma 4 is a point on the graph. Same thing with x equals 0. When you plug in 0, you'll get 4. So 0, comma 4 is a point. When x is equal to 1, the output is 2, so 1, 2. And then when x equals 2, the output will be negative 2. So 2, negative 2 is an ordered pair on the graph. So here are five x values that I plugged in. You can plug in any x value into this function because we talked about this in the previous video. This type of function, a quadratic function, the domain is the set of all real numbers. So any x value can be plugged into the function. Here's what the five points look like when you actually plot them. Negative 2, 2, negative 1, 4, 0, 4, 1, 2, and then 2, negative 2. It looks like if you plot an infinite number of points, which means that the graph is an upside down U shape, and it will have a highest point, which we'll talk about later in the course, that's called the vertex for a quadratic function's graph. And so a graph of a quadratic function has a name, it's called a parabola.
And so this is what the graph will look like for this function, f of x equals negative x squared subtract x plus 4. So let's take a look at number 2. This time the function is g of x is equal to negative and then square root, x subtract 3 is inside the square root, and then plus 1 is outside the square root. This is what's called a radical function because it involves a radical of a variable x. So again, let's try to plug in any x value that we want, as long as it's x values in the domain of the function. So I'm going to choose 2, 3, 4, 7, and 12. And so if I substitute in 2, the first thing I notice is that if I substitute in 2, I'll have square root of 2 subtract 3. That's going to give me square root of negative 1, which is not a real number. So I can't evaluate x equals 2 and get an associated y value because x equals 2 is not in the domain of the function g. So I don't get an ordered pair when x is equal to 2. So I'm going to go to the next one, x equals 3. When I plug in x equals 3, the output will be 1. So that's 3 comma 1. That will be a point on the graph of g of x. Substitute in x equals 4, the output will be 0. So 4 comma 0 will be right on the x-axis. When x equals 7, the output is negative 1. So 7 comma negative 1 is an ordered pair. And then the last one I'll choose is x equals 12, and the output is negative 2. So 12 comma negative 2. I want to have four points that I can actually plot on the graph to visualize what this function will look like. So when I plot these points, 3 comma 1, 4 comma 0 is on the x-axis, 7 comma negative 1, and 12 comma negative 2, I'm counting the x-axis by 3's in this case, I get a graph that looks like it will start when x equals 3, because whenever x equals 3, I get square root of 0. If I get anything that's to the left of x equals 3, I'll have a negative inside the square root, which we know will not generate a real number. So it looks like the graph will start at 3 comma 1, and the graph will continue to the right forever, and that's why I'm using an arrow, so that the graph will actually continue in that direction indefinitely. So although that we can graph functions by plotting points, there's a much faster way, and we can use technology for this, graphing functions with a graphing calculator. We can also use a graphing calculator to check tables and also graphs of functions like we did in the previous example. So the following slides are actually going to give you steps on how to graph a function and setting up a graphing window using a TI-83 or a TI-84 graphing calculator. So in the steps to graph a function and a set a viewing window, each step will be on the left and then on the right will actually be the graphing calculator screen that you should have so that you can follow along with the steps when we graph the function. So the first thing that you need to do when you graph a function on a graphing calculator is to go to y equals so that you can graph the function. So the first thing to notice is that each of these equations, they have y equals, so you need to have your equations solve for y first. And now if you actually want to graph a function, you need to enter it under y1, y2, y3, and so on. So the input variable is always going to be x when you have it in this screen, and you enter in the formula into the calculator. The function that we're going to graph is what's called the greatest integer function. So to get the greatest integer function, you need to go underneath the math button on the left-hand side of the calculator, scroll over to the num screen or the column and we want number five the greatest integer function which is int and they'll give you a parentheses so hit enter on the calculator and now you need to indicate what the input variable is we want to graph the greatest integer function of x so x is the variable there's your variable button and then close the parentheses because we only want the greatest integer function of just x so the next step before we actually get to setting up the viewing window is that i want to make sure that i get an accurate description of what this graph look like. So I don't want to graph a line, a connected line segment. I actually want to change this. So change the line to dots. So use the right arrow key and change it to dot mode. So it'll be clear in a second why I'm doing that with the greatest integer function. And now once that's been changed, I want to go to the window screen or the table setup button. So that's right beside the y equals button. So window. To set up the viewing window, we need to choose what's called a minimum value for the x values, so that's x min, the maximum value for the x values, x max. We will also want to have how much do we want each tick mark to count by on the x-axis, which is x scale. So for the purpose of this function, I want to go from negative 5 for the minimum, that's how far the graph will go to the left. How far to the right do I want to see? I'll go up to positive 5. The scale, I want each tick mark to count by 1's. And now the y min, same thing, that's the smallest y value. How far down does the graph go that you want to see? We'll go to negative 5, positive 5 for the y max. And again, the y scale is how much do you want the y values to count by on the y axis? We'll count by 1s. Once you have the graphing window set up correctly, the next step is you can hit graph or the table button, which is the upper right-hand corner of your graphing calculator. 
and you'll get a description of what the graph will look like. Now the reason why I was in dot mode earlier is because this is what's called a step function. The greatest integer function is a step function because the graph looks like steps or a staircase. If I have my graphing calculator in line mode, it actually in older calculators will actually connect these steps, which is not actually part of the graph. So if I'm in dot mode, I actually get an accurate description of what the graph looks like. This actually steps. So how the greatest integer function works is as follows. The greatest integer function is defined as follows. If you have double square brackets on either end of x, that's how the greatest integer function is denoted, or you sometimes could see this, where only the bottom part has the brackets, which is sometimes called floor function. The greatest integer function is also called the floor function in computer science. The greatest integer function is defined as it's the greatest integer less than or equal to x. So integers are like negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. All the positive whole numbers, all the negative whole numbers, and also 0. So for example, if you want to find the floor function of 2, what's the greatest integer that's less than or equal to 2? Well, 2 is an integer, so the greatest integer that's less than or equal to 2 is 2. If you want to do the greatest integer function of 2.3, what's the greatest integer that's less than 2.3? It's 2. So the floor function 2.3 is also 2. Now the greatest integer function of 1.999, what's the greatest integer that's less than or equal to 1.999? Well, the greatest integer that's less than, that number is 1. So don't confuse the greatest integer function with rounding. 1.999, the integer that's before it, is 1. 2 is on the right side on the number line of 1.999. So 2 is actually greater than 1.999. The greatest integer function is defined as the integer that's less than the number x. So the greatest integer function of 0.002, the greatest integer that's less than 0.002 is 0. The greatest integer function of negative 3.5, this one is a little tricky, so you have to think about it in terms of a number line. What's the greatest integer that's less than negative 3.5? It's negative 4, because negative 4 is on the left side of a number line of 3 point, negative 3.5, but negative 3 is actually greater than negative 3.5. And then the greatest integer function of negative 0.5, for the same reason, the greatest integer that's less than negative 0.5 is negative 1. So that gives you an idea of how the greatest integer function actually works, which is why the output are all integer values, and that's why you get the staircase or the steps when you look at its graph. So notice that the left endpoint of each line segment on the graph is included since the greatest integer that's less than or equal to an integer is itself, like we had the greatest integer of 2 was just 2, if you're on the left endpoint of an interval, then you're actually going to include that. And on the right endpoint, you do not include that because the greatest integer function of 1.999 was 1, but then when you get closer and closer to 2, it will actually jump up to having an output value of 2. And so if you don't want to include the right endpoint, you don't have a solid point, you use what's called an open circle on that point. So the domain of a greatest integer function is the set of all real numbers, because you can substitute in any real number you want into the greatest integer function, but the output will only be integer values. The greatest integer function is a step function, because the graph looks like steps, but it's also what's called a piecewise defined function. So we're going to graph piecewise defined functions next. A piecewise defined function is defined by different formulas on different parts of the domain. As you might expect, the graph will actually have different parts of its graph look like different types of functions. So we'll have different pieces of the graph that we'll actually need to plot points for. A function that is called continuous, and this is a very important concept in calculus, a function is continuous if the graph has no breaks, jumps, or holes in the graph. So example two, graphing a piecewise defined function. Graph the following piecewise defined functions and determine its domain and range from the graph. Number one, f of x is equal to the absolute value of x, so vertical bars around the x just means absolute value. It is defined this way because it is a piecewise defined function. Absolute value of x is just x if x is greater than or equal to 0. In other words, if you're inputting a positive number or 0, then the number stays exactly as it is, as the output value. And the absolute value of x is the opposite of the value of x if x is a negative number. So in other words, if you put a negative number inside an absolute value, it will be the opposite sign. It will turn positive. So the opposite of a negative number, that will be a positive number afterwards. So notice that this function is defined up into two different pieces. It's x, or y equals x, if x is greater than or equal to 0, and it's y equals negative x if x is less than 0. These are two different types of linear functions. y equals x has a slope of 1, 
So when x is greater than or equal to 0, you'll have a slope of 1 and a y-intercept of 0. And the other function is y equals negative x when x is less than 0. That has a slope of negative 1, and it'll have a y-intercept of 0. When you graph the two different types of linear functions, y equals x and y equals negative x, you'll get a v-shaped graph. And that's what the absolute value function will look like. It'll be a v-shaped graph where the two different lines will intersect one another at 0, 0, or the origin. So notice that every single x value will make up the graph. So the domain is a set of all real numbers. So negative infinity to infinity is the domain for the absolute value function. But its output values are only 0 and above, or positive values for y. So the range is including 0, because I do have a point at 0, 0, the origin. So bracket on 0 and all the positive y values, so comma infinity. Okay, number two. This time we're going to look at the function g of x is equal to this piecewise defined function. It's x squared subtract 3 whenever x is less than or equal to 1, and it's the function 2x plus 1 whenever x is greater than 1. So we have y equals x squared minus 3 when x is less than or equal to 1. That's a quadratic function that we encountered earlier, so we're going to actually graph it by plotting points. So g of x is equal to x squared minus 3 if x is less than or equal to 1. I can only substitute in values of x that are less than or equal to 1 to get the graph of this function. So I'm going to choose these values, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, and the farthest I can go is 1. So when I plug in negative 3, I'll get y value 6, negative 2, I'll get y value of 1, negative 1, I'll get 2. When I plug in 0, I'll get output of negative 3, and when the input is 1, the output is negative 2. So I get these five points. If I plot those five points, I get this part of the graph. It will be a U-shaped graph because a quadratic function we know will be a U-shape, and it will be what's called a parabola, but the graph will continue to the left forever because I can choose any x value that I want to plug in to this function and get a y value as long as the x value is less than or equal to 1. So I can choose any x value that's less than 1 and I'll get a point. But I can only go for this part of the graph up to x equals 1. So that's where the graph will stop. It'll stop at 1 comma negative 2. And so since there's a point there at x equals 1, y equals negative 2, that is going to be a filled in point. So you do want that point included in your graph. Now on the other hand, g of x is equal to 2x plus 1 whenever x is greater than 1. So this is a linear function. We know its graph is going to be a straight line. But again, we know that we can only plug in x values that are greater than 1 to actually generate its graph. So again, I'm going to make a table of values so I can actually generate a set of ordered pairs. So I can plot points. So even though the x values need to be greater than 1, I can get really, really close to 1. I can choose like 1.00001. So I want to find out where does this graph start at x equals 1. So I'm going to choose 1, and then 2, 3, 4, and 5 to plug in to get some points. When I plug in 1 into this function, I'll get 3. But that point is not actually part of the graph, because I can't plug in 1 into this part of the function. Its domain does not include x equals 1. So 1 comma 3 is going to be an open circle off part of the graph, because I don't want that point included. Whenever x is equal to 2, you get a y value of 5, so 2 comma 5. When x is 3, you'll get 7, and so on you'll find out that all these points will lie on a straight line, like a linear function should, and so the graph will go up to the right forever. But the graph will start at 1, 3, and that 1, 3 is not part of the graph. And so again, a piecewise defined function will be defined by different types of functions or different types of formulas, and so will the graph. The graph looks like a parabola up until the point 1, 2, and then it will be a straight line at 1, 3, and then as you continue to the right. So what does the domain of this function look like? Well, I'm using every single x value as part of the graph. I'm using any x value that's less than or equal to 1, and I'm also using any x value that's greater than 1. So all real numbers, so negative infinity to, to infinity is the domain. So notice for the range that the graph doesn't go any lower than negative 3. That's the smallest y value. So negative 3, there was a point there, so it's a square bracket. And I'm using every single y value that's above negative 3. So negative 3, comma, infinity, and a parenthesis on infinity again. So a couple more things we need to talk about in this video. Not every graph that we're going to encounter in the real world is actually going to represent a graph of a function. So if we're going to use the definition of a function, we need to have every x value is going to be used, but it can only correspond to exactly one y value in the range. So this is going to give us a test that we can actually find out whether a graph represents a function or not. And it's what's called the vertical line test. So the theorem, the vertical line test, says a curve in the rectangular coordinate system, or xy plane, represents a function if and only if no vertical line intersects the curve more than once. 
So if a vertical line can be drawn anywhere on the graph and intersect the curve more than once, that curve's not a function. Otherwise, the graph is a function. So here's an example of a graph that would be a function. I can draw any vertical line, and that vertical line will only intersect the curve once. So if I draw a vertical line at x equals a, it'll intersect the graph one time, so this one x value will correspond to exactly one y value. So that will pass the vertical line test, and this graph is a function. On the other hand, this other graph is not representing a function because I can draw a vertical line at this x value, which is x equals a. It will intersect the graph two different points. You'll have a y value of b and also another point at y value of c. So if x equals a, y equals c, and x equals a, y equals b. That fails the definition of a function. I found one x value that corresponds to not just one y value, but more than one y value. So this graph would not represent a function. So example three, we're going to use the vertical line test to find out which of these four graphs represent functions and which ones do not. So the first graph, it's going to be an ellipse. I can draw a vertical line that will intersect an ellipse at more than one point, so that's not a graph of a function. The second graph is what's called a polynomial function. We're going to see those later in the course. This graph will go down to the left. It has a couple hill, it has a hill, and it has a valley, and the graph will continue up to the right forever. I can draw any vertical line, and it will intersect the graph exactly one time. So that it does pass a vertical line test, so the graph is a function. This third graph looks like a piecewise defined function because it looks like it's in different pieces. There's three different pieces, there's three different line segments. It is a function, I can draw any vertical line, it'll intersect exactly one time each time. And this last graph does not represent a function because any vertical line can intersect the graph more than once. So it would fail the vertical line test. So now that we know whether graphs can represent functions or not, which ones will and which ones won't using the vertical line test, now we're gonna find out which types of equations can actually represent functions. So we have an equation that involves x variables and y variable. So the equation represents a relationship between the two different variables. However, we've seen that not all graphs are functions. We've seen not all, not all descriptions are functions. How do you know if a, an equation is a function? Well, if an equation can be solved for the dependent variable y, so if you can get y by itself, and more than one y value can be obtained for any given x value for the independent variable x, then that equation does not represent a function. So in other words, if you can get y by itself, and if there are more than one y value for any x value, then that equation is not a function. Otherwise, the equation is a function. Example four, determining whether an equation is a function. Determine whether the following equations defines y as a function of x. And so in other words, solve the equation for y, determine whether y can be defined as a function of x explicitly using a formula. Number one, x squared plus y equals 25. Solve the equation for y, the dependent variable. And so if you want to get y by itself, subtract both sides by x squared. So you'll have x squared plus y equals 25 is the same thing as y equals by itself 25 subtract x squared. Notice that any x value that I choose to plug in for this equation for x, I will obtain exactly one y value. So this equation does represent a function. Every x value from the domain will correspond to exactly one y value in the range. Number two, how about the equation x squared plus y squared equals 25? If you take this equation and solve the equation for the dependent variable y, you'll have x squared plus y squared equals 25. Well, again, subtract x squared on both sides of the equation to get y squared is equal to 25 subtract x squared. But now notice the equation doesn't have y by itself, it's y squared by itself. If you want to get y by itself, you need to undo the square, so that would be square root. Take the square root on both sides of the equation, and now this is a very important point. Whenever you take the square root, or even root actually, on either side of the equation to solve for a variable, you need to put a plus or a minus. Because there could be two different y values that give you that one x. So to cancel out the square power, you take the square root, that will give you y on the left hand side, is equal to plus or minus, you need to insert the plus or minus yourself, and it's the square root of 25 minus x squared. That does not simplify any further, okay? In other words, square root of 25 minus x squared, that's completely simplified. It is not equal to five minus x. You cannot take the square root of each term inside a square root when a subtraction sign or a plus sign. So the square root of 25 minus x squared, that is the expression whenever you get y by itself, but you need to put the plus or minus in. The plus or minus is what makes this equation not represent a function because if I can plug in any x value for this x, then I'll get two different y values. Okay, for example, if I choose x equals 4, for example, if I plug in 4, I'll have plus or minus, 
square root 25 minus 4 squared, or I'll have plus or minus square root of 25 minus 16 inside the square root, which is plus or minus square root of 9, which is plus or minus 3. So when I have this one x value, x equals 4, I'll have y equals 3 and y equals negative 3 as potential outputs. That violates the definition of a function. I have one x value, but multiple output values. And so this type of equation would not represent a function. Okay, the last thing that we need to talk about in this video, the following table actually will show graphs of very common functions that we're going to encounter in this course that will actually come up quite often in pre-calculus and even in further math classes. So linear functions we talked about in this video, they can be either constant functions, they are horizontal lines, y equals b, they'll cross the y-axis at, at the y-intercept of b, Otherwise, there'll be lines that either go up to the right or down to the right, which will depend on the slope's value. Positive slope will go up to the right, negative slope will go down to the right. For power functions is where you have a function of this form. f of x is equal to x to the n, where n can be any integer value, so like x squared, x cubed, x to the fourth, and so on. The graphs will be curves. We have saw y equals x squared, so a quadratic function will be a u-shaped graph. Those are called parabolas y equals x cubed will be this shape, x to the fourth will be this shape, so it'll be a u shape but a little bit more skinny around the origin, and then y equals x to the fifth will look like that. Root functions are also called radical functions. They are of the form f of x is equal to the nth root or the nth radical of x. n is called the index, x is the variable that's inside the root. So we saw square root of x in this section. We have f of x is equal to square root of x, it'll look like this. Notice that the graph doesn't go any further to the left than the origin because you cannot substitute any negative values into an, a square root. Those are not real numbers. You have a square root of negative 1, that doesn't exist. So the graph will start at 0, 0, and the graph will go up to the right. The cube root of x, you can substitute in negative values because the cube root of negative 8 is negative 2. Negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2 is a negative number, negative 8. So you can plug in negative values, you can plug in zero, you can plug in positive values into a cube root, and that's what the graph will look like. The fourth root of x, because it's an even root, same reason as a square root, you don't have any points on the left side of the origin, the graph will look like that. And again, the fifth root is an odd root. You can take the odd root of negative numbers, so the graph will look like this. Reciprocal functions are sometimes called rational functions. They'll look like f of x equals one divided by x to some integer power. And the graph will look like these. We'll talk more about rational functions in the next chapter. Absolute value function we saw in this video. Those are V-shaped graphs. This absolute value of x will actually have a V that actually will meet at the origin, 0, 0. And the greatest integer function we saw in this video as well, it's a staircase function or a step function. The left endpoints are included as part of the graph because those are integer values. But then the right endpoints are not included. Those are going to be holes in the graph. So open circles. The reason why I'm mentioning these types of graphs is because knowing the basic shapes of linear functions, power functions, radical functions, reciprocal functions, the absolute value function, and even the greatest integer function are going to come in when we talk about transformations of functions later in the course. Knowing the basic shape of the graph is going to be very helpful later on in math. So this finishes our video on graphs of functions where we talked about graphing functions by plotting points, by using a graphing calculator to actually visualize what the graph of a function will look like determining whether a graph actually represents a function using a vertical line test, and also whether an equation represents a function. If you have any questions about any examples in this video, please let me know. Or if you have any questions while you work on the homework for this section, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video when we talk about obtaining more information from the graph of a function.